Hello and welcome everyone. The IQAC in collaboration with the Department of Philosophy, Lakhimpur Girls College presents to you the webinar lecture on the current COVID-19 pandemic and the need for a philosophical perspective with Mr. Pradeep Khatonir, a retired associate professor and former head of the Department of the Department of Philosophy, Cotton University, Gauhati, which was organized on 10 July 2020. When life strikes us down, we started searching for the reasons and meaning of it. According to one of the greatest contemporary philosophers, Wittgenstein, when life is in a rough and rocky place, the need for thinking emerges. He wrote, I quote, we have landed on smooth ice where there is no friction. So in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal, but just because of that, we cannot walk. We want to walk, so we need friction back to rough ground. When everything is functioning smoothly, then the need for thinking does not arise. But when there is friction, when there are some differences, disturbances, problems, puzzles, then the need for thinking emerges. And in the present situation, we find a big global problem. And therefore, there is a need for concerted effort to think of a program. COVID-19 has created sort of friction. It has created a sort of crisis having an existential dimension, as well as a social dimension, apart from many other dimensions, like the economic and the medical, which his philosophy is not directly concerned. As a result, it has created a need for examining some old ideas. It has unsettled many conventional approaches to life and the world. The false sense of security that we carry with us has been destroyed by it. The established order is thereby silenced. Our social life is based on integrity, mutual contact or the act of coming close to one another. But we are now told to stand apart, to maintain distance. We cannot now physically extend the hand to another individual for his benefit <coughs> as well as for our benefit. We have to stand apart. Social gathering is to be avoided because such gathering may lead to the spread of the virus. Isolation is to be cultivated. This isolation is not the solitude of a sage engaged in meditation. It is the solitude generated by isolation and this attitude of solitude is to be cultivated by an ordinary individual. Emphasis upon isolation. And instead of coming together, we are falling apart. Two distinguished philosophers, uh, two, sorry, two distinguished writers, one is a philosopher, the other is not. In their own way, looked for literary analogs of this much needed cultivation of isolation. One is the famous philosopher Slavoj Zizek. Slavoj Zizek is an European philosopher from Slovenia. A few months ago, Slavoj Zizek published a book titled Pandemic COVID-19 Six the World. When Mary, he, re, he refers to a biblical incident. When Mary Magdalene met Jesus just after his resurrection, then Jesus said to her, pass me not. This is found in the gospel according to John, chapter 20, verse 17. Referring to this narrative, Jesus wrote that now in the midst of the coronavirus epidemic, we are all bombarded precisely by calls not to touch others, to maintain a proper corporeal distance. Christ talked about our corporeal distance, but he never intended that this corporeal distance is meant to establish spiritual distance. Similarly, when we maintain the so-called social distance during coronavirus, we are not distancing ourselves spiritually. 
or mentally or emotionally from others. Rather, through this physical distancing, we are seeking to establish a greater mental link with the other individual. Our physical distance is meant to bring about bodily welfare for us and also for the other individual. Bodily segregation is here a means for establishing a greater bondage through the establishment of some sort of welfare. So I refer to Slavozize. Another writer is a writer from Assam. His name is Sobudra Gupta Paisio, a journalist, not a philosopher. He published an article in the Assam Tribune, a medium. In that article, he quoted a Bihu song. Usor sapi sapi nahiba nasan, tomar gat mohaniyas. Then, sir, don't come closer if there's some attractive teaser in your personality. We are told to keep distance from others. Don't come here, keep a distance. You don't have an attractive feature, but you might be a carrier of this deadly virus. Or I myself might be unknowingly to me a carrier of this virus. So he found a literary analog of this situation in a Bihu song. It is an interpretation. Anyway, the world has seen COVID-19 for the first time. We now face a pandemic. The dictionary definition of pandemic is the following. I consulted Macmillan Dictionary, Macmillan Comprehensive Dictionary. A pandemic is defined in the dictionary as a disease prevalent throughout an entire country or continent or the whole world. COVID-19 pandemic has covered all countries of the world or perhaps almost all countries of the world. I'm not sure one or two countries of the Pacific Ocean, the island country, maybe outside of this uh, coronavirus pandemic. But almost every country of the world is affected by it. In the history of the world, we find many pandemics but somehow the risks of these pandemics were not fully global. The first pandemic affecting many countries, which was reported by a well-known Greek historian, was the Plague of Athens. The Plague of Athens, it was the first recorded, fully recorded epidemic. The historian was Tukidides, the book in which he gave his record of this pandemic was history of the Peloponnesian War. It is a classic Greek language. History of the Peloponnesian War. The year of the epidemic was 430 BC. Thukydides himself had suffered from this disease, but had recovered. This pandemic affected many countries like Ethiopia, Egypt, Libya, Greece, and a great part of Turkey, etc. The political leader of Athens at the time was Pericles, and Pericles died of this plague. This plague devastated Athens. Almost 75,000 to 100,000 people were killed. Athens was ruined. Ultimately, Athens was militarily defeated by the great military power of the time, Sparta, in a war known as the Peloponnesian War. Together this room, I quote, words indeed fail one when one tries to give a general picture of this disease. And as for the sufferings of individuals, they seemed almost beyond the capacity of human nature to endure. Here, in particular, is a point this showed it's something quite different from ordinary. Though 
there were many dead bodies lying about unburied. The birds and animals that ate human flesh either did not come near them or if they did taste the flesh, died of it afterwards. <coughs> this quotation is from the history of the fall of Peloponnesia Noir. I consulted the penguin. Tukidai also pointed out the effects of this pandemic upon the Athenian society in general. He pointed out that this pandemic brought in the beginnings of a state of unprecedented lawlessness. Because of this pandemic, a great period of lawlessness entered into this. Compared to this ancient pandemic, during the present pandemic, we are not, uh, we are in a better process. There is a clear scientific understanding of the cause of the present pandemic. There is a much better medical treatment, a better maintenance of social order, including the rule of law, political, social, and medical management of the disease. And the situation emerging out of the disease definitely is much better nowadays. A vaccine is at sight, but of course, the coming of the vaccine is not going to be quick as we hope it would be. So this is the difference between the famous pandemic affecting Athens in 430 BC and the present pandemic crisis affecting almost everyone of our people. The COVID-19 pandemic is unsettling in many ways. The withdrawal of individuals from contact with one another, the general cessation of all activities have made us question the nature of our link with our physical environment once again. Towards the second half of the 20th century, people had strongly realized that the human program of exercising control over nature is ultimately unjustified and untenable. I'm referring to Francis Bacon. The Baconian view that knowledge is power had generated an exploitative attitude to nature. There was a realization that this attitude has many defects and it is necessary to amend and revise this attitude. A more cordial relationship with nature is required. The need for relationship was felt during the last few decades. Many writers have started seeing the present pandemic as a manifestation of Nessar's revenge or Nessar's backlash. There was a need for a pause. The diverse human activities often verged on one basic point, exploitation of Nessar. A pause was required. Lockdowns have been seen by many thinkers as some form of pause. <coughs> Such a pause may save us from catching the virus and also save nature. This is one aspect of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. We require the pause, many thinkers, and lockdown has given this pause. This pause is uh, being hailed by many people, and it is felt that this pause is having a beneficial effect upon the human relationship with nature. Radhakrishnan had once remarked that the modern man suffers from a basic malady. He cannot remain for a long time confined or seated in a room and face himself. He always wants to escape from himself and hence he is easily distracted. Radhakrishnan specifically uh, mentioned this point in one of his books. Perhaps the book is The Recovery of Fit. The Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset pointed out that man has the ability to direct his attention on himself. He has the ability to withdraw himself from the external distractions and focus on the self. But though man has this ability, yet under the ordinary circumstances, is averse to coming back to himself. 
to pace himself. This swaying by external distractions is a kind of escape mechanism. Man wants to escape from himself. This is the reason why enforcing lockdown regulation is so difficult. People are not comfortable with themselves. Instead of encountering the self, they want to escape from the self. A false sense of freedom guides them. A false sense of comfort is operative in the mind. That is why even during the lockdown, we find people trying to loiter in the street. This is not an activity directed at discovering something or getting some sort of information. It is basically an activity prompted by our attempt to escape from ourselves. We do not want to face ourselves. We feel comfortable by trying to escape from ourselves. And that is why we do not want to remain confined within our homes, talking to ourselves and being happy with our family. We want to escape. We want to go out. And that is why enforcing lockdown norms is so difficult. Constant distraction is what the violators of lockdown are looking for. The false sense of comfort makes them put off protective masks. A false quest for freedom or comfort leads to our abandoning a life of reason, which, as Socrates pointed out, is ethically the highest life. The life of reason, Socrates said, is the highest life. True happiness is found in the life of reason. But we want to avoid reason. We look for a false type of freedom. That is why we are not comfortable with the protective mask. We want to abandon. We go and we try to congregate in the marketplace. The life of reason is never contrary to the rational and scientific spirit. It is this scientific spirit that has discovered certain courses of actions to protect people from coronavirus. But it is in conflict with the sorcerer, the sorcerer cited life of pleasure. Mostly these, these pleasure seekers, guided by greed, are thronging the marketplace. They may be there not to buy essentials. A hard instinct may be drawing them out from their homes. We are driven by what McDougall called hard, hard instinct. We always want to belong to a group. That is why we try to congregate. Instead of staying within home, we want to go out and congregate in a public place by violating the lockdown norms. It is the hard instinct that is operative. COVID-19 has brought to focus in certain ways based part of our spirit. We find news items of people who are guided by philanthropic motives. Often ordinary people are helping others. Many salary earning people are donating food and other essential items to the poor and the needy. The society is discovering its true social dimension, but a great deal of comprehensive planning is required. Life within a community can be meaningful, comfortable, and worthwhile when there is a major action plan. Political philosophy might note that such an action plan during the present COVID-19 pandemic can have full interrelated programs. We require a concerted program, program during this COVID-19 pandemic. The first is the program of containing the virus. It is a virus that has jumped from animal to man and is creating havoc. There has to be a program to contain. This is a big political sense. The second is delaying the spread of the disease. Absolute stopping of mutual contact is perhaps not possible. Food supply, medical emergency, etc., make total isolation difficult or almost impossible. But the sense of mutual contact may be minimized, and this will lead to delaying the spread of coronavirus. The third is medical research. 
This research is directed towards discovering a cure of disease and an adequate preventive measure. Prevention demands vaccine and cure demands certain types of medic medicines. All these are possible through appropriate medical research. The, the research laboratories have to work to their full capability by employing the best scientific minds. The fourth program is the program of mitigating, mitigating the impact of this pandemic. The economic impact and the educational impact are of special importance. The world has come to a grinding halt. <clears throat> but without war, wealth cannot be generated. There should be adequate plans for opening up economic activities during and after coronavirus. The field of education has seen a doldrum. The sales of education will require new wins in new forms. All these programs can be undertaken by the political leadership with the help of the people. The success or failure of a political setup will be determined by the spirit and effectiveness with which these programs are enacted. There is a need for a fourfold program or four programs that are interrelated. The distinguished Greek philosopher Heraclitus wrote about 2,500 years ago that the way up is the way down. But in our own way, From the way down, we have to seek a way up. Our social life has become extremely contracted during the present pandemic. Educational institutions are almost closed. Economic activities have come to a halt. We are living without our regular printed newspapers, printed magazines, and new books. Travel, this is not just a matter of specific need but also education is nowhere to be seen. Everywhere there is a way down. But in this way down, there is a, there is a program or there are programs for rebuilding our social and intellectual life. There is no seminar, but there are webinars. There is no travel, but there is contact through social media. There are no printed newspapers, but we have now e-papers. There is no way of bringing a new book from the bookshop or the library or through Amazon or Flipkart. But there is the Kindle, there, there are the free e-books. The way down has created a way up. Thinkers have attempted to devise a plan for reorienting the human relationship with nature. The hints for a way up are there. A whole program guided by sanguine ideas seem to be on the verge of emergence. Taking an, taking an optimistic view, we can say that the worst of a situation is capable of bringing out the best in the human spirit. The future is always unpredictable, but let us hope that the future is not dark. We are not coming to the end of the world. We are facing a pause. Let us hope this pause will give us an opportunity to re-examine the nature of the human predicament. It is an opportunity for self-renewal. Let our sanitization accept to our mind also. Let us do away with the negativistic ideas and hope for a new future. Mankind faced many pandemics, but the spirit of man triumphs over all of them. History is full of evidences uh, or, and instances. So with this, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for a 
very brief, concise, and then fully packed with philosophical thoughts, research. It's really amazing to hear from you after such a long time, sir. So participants, if you have questions, you can type in the chat box and sir will try to answer the, the answer to your question. Thank you, sir. Oh. Uh, I'm Bhupan Chute. I talked to you yesterday. Yes, yes, I did. Um, it is a really interesting uh, talk on your part today. Uh, although we have been living through this uh, harrowing time uh, for the last few, quite few months, uh, we have started living a kind of different life, a quite uh, unfamiliar life for many of us, uh, we have got a new normal type, normalcy. We have uh, been, a, I mean, being forced to live a new normal life inside the homes, keeping distance. There was a time when we used to keep talk about social uh, closeness, coming closer to people. Now we are advocating distancing as a means of survival. It is very interesting. Of course, uh, we have been doing it, but we have we have not been able to think over it. Okay, what kind of life we have been uh, living now for this so many years, for so many months? Uh, we have been talking about uh, uh, the change of uh, transformation of our uh, total vocabulary. All right, we have been using a new vocabulary. We have been uh, we have been transformed into okay, transformed into different. Uh, narratives we have got uh, today uh, many people are claiming that um, our political narrative today is uh, transforming itself into an emergency narrative or another police narrative a police society i mean uh, you know a society to totally under police control police role uh, what do you have to say about this don't you think we are all all over the world today of course we are uh, living under an emergency situation, which can have political emergency or other uh, power emergency, emergency political power. Uh, we can have some adverse uh, situation, or other adverse kind of um, life for us. Many people are claiming that in most uh, societies, countries, the government governments are turning the countries into a kind of emergency uh, kind of situation. Uh, curtailing the very basic rights of the people. Uh, do you do you agree with this kind such kind of accusations? You definitely have a very important point. Actually, mm -hmm. politics is uh, basically about power. And politicians generally try to concentrate power in their hands. There is a situation which would facilitate them to draw power to them. Then surely they will exploit that situation. That is their tendency. But in the present situation, there are certain certain compulsions compulsions uh, associated with the need for and compulsions uh, which are dictated by an entire program which has its uh, a root in medical necessity so to some extent, politicians will definitely try to uh, reap some sort of harvest in the troubled waters. But I think in the present situation, we don't have a clear way out. We don't have a clear way out. There's no alternative. Some sort of freedom will have to be surrendered. Some sort of uh, some sort of rendering of freedom will be required. 
I don't have now the freedom to congregate in a marketplace, but I'm ready to surrender this freedom temporarily because I know that this will benefit me and this will be beneficial to the society in general. So when to a certain extent, a certain amount of freedom is to be surrendered for the benefit of greater welfare, which I hope ultimately will bring greater freedom, then we should be ready for this little bit of sacrifice. But we should, we should always be vigilant about the uh, ultimate possibility of uh, bringing in a culture of uh, service. It must not bring a culture of service. And we should be vigilant about it. We are surrendering a little amount of uh, freedom, but this is not an absolute surrender. This surrender has certain conditions, and only within these conditions, which are uh, framed by medical emergency, we are surrendering this little bit of freedom. But this uh, should not be made a matter of habit. I hope it will not turn to a habit in the later part of our life when the epidemic is gone. That is my uh, One, I have one more question, sir. That's a, uh, this pandemic has come as a challenge to our very existence. That is, uh, we have been, men has been claiming that we have conquered nature. We have mastered nature. We have tamed nature. We are the, now, uh, we, there was a tendency among us to think that we are the Lord of our nature. Instead, okay, instead of thinking that we are the product of nature, we started thinking that we can conquer, we have conquered, we can master. But suddenly, we, today we realize that, well, we are not that powerful, that we are rather helpless in the face of a hostile or unforgiving nature. Don't you think uh, this pandemic can uh, lead to a, a rethinking on the way we have started philosophizing our presence on this globe, our existence on the globe, our role on this globe? I hope so. I hope so. Actually, the human relationship uh, with nature is not a very healthy relationship. It passed through three stages. First, people felt that they are overwhelmed by nature and they are completely controlled by nature. That was the period of the caveman when people lived in, the, in constant fear of the forces of nature and they worship the forces of this. Then there came the industrial revolution. There came the period in which science and technology became dominant and people started feeling that they have acquired mastery over this. They have started exploiting this. This is the period of uh, mastery over nature. The, in this period, the exploitative attitude to nature was fostered. The third period saw gradual emergence, and in this third period, we feel that we should coexist with this. We are not the lords and masters of nature, but we share this natural world with other living beings. So there should be a sort of coexistence between men and other, other living beings. So we should have a reverential attitude, the attitude towards nature instead of trying to exploit nature or instead of trying to exercise mastery over nature. So this change of attitude to nature will be accelerated by our present thinking connected with this pandemic. We feel that this virus has jumped from animal to man because somehow we are 
having an exploitative attitude to the animals. So we should be careful with dealing with animals. We should be careful with dealing with other things belonging to this. So this big lesson perhaps we will learn. And I hope this will be the plus point of this entire uh, pandemic by way of instruction. Okay, sir, we have some question. This is a question from one of our participant, esteemed participant who asks, can Bharatiya's philosophy offer any hope in this situation? Indian philosophy can offer hope in this situation in two ways, as I see. Number one, the Indian emphasis, the Indian philosophical emphasis of meditation, upon our withdrawal to ourselves enables us to cope with such a stressful situation. Emphasis upon meditation, the practice of withdrawing ourselves to ourselves, which is found in the yoga system of Indian philosophy, may help us to deal with certain stresses and strains and anxiety that might emerge in such a situation in which we are cutting ourselves from others and confining ourselves to our homes. So this is one way in uh, Indian philosophy may help. Then in the second way, in Indian philosophy, there is a big concept called Vasudha Eva Kutumbakam. The whole world is your family, your relative. You have a profound intimate relationship with the entire universe. So instead of taking an exploitative attitude to the others, to the other species belonging to nature, you are to cultivate the attitude of cooperation. You should extend an attitude of love, not an attitude of exploitation to others. This a big idea is contained in Indian philosophy, particularly in the concept of Vasudhaiva's Kutumbo. And this might help us to cope with the present situation and to reorient our thinking about our relationship with nature. So these are two ways in which Indian philosophy, I think, can help us in this present pandemic. That is my answer. Hope uh, the person who have asked this question and all the rest of the participants have received their answer. And we still have some question. Let me proceed with another question. It say, sir, don't you think that along with the people getting diseased by this pandemic, the narratives on the pandemic too is diseased? Uh, well, <laughs> The questioner is uh, playing with the word disease. Uh, the narrative of the pan pandemic definitely has a linguistic aspect. And as you know, language is many dimensions. And language has a great persuasive force, language as a uh, force by which it can give information, but apart from giving information, it can also persuade, it can also motivate, it can also mislead. Now, if the language of the pandemic is not used, being used properly, then it may mislead. And such misleading, in the misleading, such act of misleading is seen in certain cases. The language is not used properly. And that is why by uh, a way of language, sometimes people are misled. And the narrative of the COVID pandemic should therefore be 
used with a great deal of care so that the public welfare is not there, right? Effect. Yes, that is the answer. We have another question. This question is again, sir, beyond all the philosophical anecdotes you have delightfully referred to. Can this pandemic be considered as infodemic under post-truth philosophical perspective? There is nothing like post-truth. Post-truth is an idea created by some imperialist, new imperialists for their welfare, for their benefit. <coughs> we are not in a period of post-truth. Truth is there. There is no nothing called post-truth. There are alternative standpoints, but there is nothing like post-truth. So, uh, the truth about the, the pandemic, we hope, will be one truth, and this truth, we believe, can be discovered through the appropriate scientific method. There are alternative interpretations, but uh, some interpretations might be correct, some might be correct. And there is a logical procedure for determining the correctness of an interpretation or the incorrectness of an interpretation. So I believe in the supremacy of logic. I believe in the supremacy of logical thinking. I don't believe in such ideas like post -truths. Okay, sir, thank you. The person who have asked will definitely have uh, his or her answer. Now, there is one question coming. It's uh, quite interesting and then I hope the person who asks will be very much benefited from your answer. It says, with essentially coming to a halt, I mean, with everything essentially coming to a halt, it has been witnessed that the number of cases of domestic violence has also increased leaps and bounds. So, is it an indication of an emotional and psychological divide emerging out of the frustration? Yes, now people are confining themselves to their homes. Families are staying together. But when a family stay together for a very extended period without coming into contact with others, then definitely some points of conflict will emerge between them. And many people are not capable of managing these conflicts and they quite often lead to violence because we find that in many families the foundation is not love but the foundation is some sort of uh, consistency you may say. So when the foundation of the family is not love but some sort of contingent uh, some sort of uh, contingent or some uh, contingency or some sort of contract, then there is every sense of conflict in society. And that is what we see this. When people are staying together, then they are quarreling, and some quarrels are leading to violence. This cause does not lie in the coronavirus, but the cause lies in the failure of placing love in the center stage of family life. It's a very big issue. That is my answer. Okay, sir. Right now, we will just try to answer one question, and after which, we will proceed on with the uh, closing part. Let, let's have this question. The question for us here is, being a philosopher, what would be your message to the masses about the way of life in the pandemic situation? 
Sí, I am not a philosopher. And uh, though I have come across one or two philosophers, I know I'm not a philosopher. I taught philosophy for some time. Anyway, uh, I can at most say that let us be careful in establishing some sort of physical contact with others and true care perhaps it will be possible for, for us to save ourselves and also we should remain mentally quite mentally quite active the period that we spend there in our home should be spent in fruitful and meaningful activities. They may be physical activities or intellectual activities. So that after the expiry of this pandemic, we may march from our respective caves as fit people, people living in a better world. That is what I have to say. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions that the participants have. And we still have some questions. As we come to the end part of the program, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Bhupen Sutia, sir, our IQAC coordinator, to pronounce a word of things. So thank you, Babishan, for offering me this opportunity of uh, expressing our Gratitude to our honorable sir today and also our other uh, our participants. Uh, we have been actually organizing a series of webinars for the last uh, few days. Today is uh, was the 13th lecture. Uh, stuck in, uh, in the process uh, under this pandemic, we started with uh, we started thinking of uh, getting ourselves engaged in some kind of positive um, positive discussions and accordingly we uh, invited experts from various fields and um, there were some sessions on psychology some, some, from some science technology language literature and today of course we have, we got the opportunity of listening to uh, the perspective philosophical perspectives on our day-to-day uh, -day experience, experience of a pandemic. Uh, I, on behalf of Lakhimbu Girls College, IQAC of Lakhimbu Girls College, would like to offer our gratitude to Professor Pradeep Khatunya, sir, uh, to the participants, uh, I like inform them that he was my uh, teacher, I was a student, uh, under his, uh, when I was in college, high secondary level. I think uh, I, was, I was very much excited to see him today after almost 28 years. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, young colleagues from the Department of Philosophy uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and giving me this opportunity of seeing our start today. Um, thank you, sir, for your valuable time and valuable perspective. Uh, I'd also like to uh, offer our thanks to the participants who have been really uh, encouraging. Actually, their presence, their attendance, their participation has encouraged us during the last few days. And uh, today, I like their participation. And I also thank our, our principals of Lucky Bugal Scholars for leading from the front in this particular webinar series and gratitude to all other uh, faculty members of this college and i once again thank you all especially our uh, speaker today uh, thank you and over to our organizers thank you so much Bhupen, sir for your kind word to our sir
Yes, I also would like to mention a few. Many people has joined this webinar's lecture and then they mention why you want to attend. They say that Pradeep sir is speaking. So we want to attend, which means that you have influenced quite a lot of people and most of the participants out here are, were being touched by you once in your life. So we are so grateful to you, sir, and thank you for being uh, coming with us. And I thank our principal, sir, for being with us from uh, the beginning till now and then from the time we have started organizing this program. I also thank the IQAC coordinator and I should not forget my department faculty. I thank Tulumuni ma'am, I thank Anil Hajurika sir, I thank Megdav Sunwal sir, and even uh, I thank some of the faculty who are being a part of this program, who were helping us, and also the technical team. And I should not forget all the participants. Now, to this very end, I would like to invite our principal sir to conclude the meeting. So, thank you sir for your nice talk. I think participants will be benefited from this. And I also thank once again for giving your valuable time with us and we'll be in touch with you. And with these few lines, I would like to declare this session end.